Hey guys, this meeting is being recorded, just so you know. I guess it's 12 o'clock uh, when Basti and Travers and Micah are on, on my committee, uh, just let me know. Uh, and then I'll go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. Hello. Michael, Howie, everybody. Hey, is Michael on too? Micah? Uh, yeah, Figures. we're waiting on Micah. Figures. Just kidding, just kidding. Michael, this is the whole nine yards. It's very official. I like yeah. the picture. You look very nice. Very Thank you. I appreciate it. I can't see any of you guys, but it's just for my purposes. Uh, all right. I'm going to use this time wisely to set up a Micah. Micah. I'll message him also. I'm going to do something else, too. Hold on. For all of you that just uh, tuned in, thank you again, but um, we're just waiting on one more person in my committee and then we'll be ready to go. Um, 12.30 Michael thesis. <clears throat> Sorry, I said Howie. It's Bashy. Um, Bashy is here, yeah. Uh, Howie's here too. All right. Yeah, sorry, I forgot that. Uh, whatever. But yeah. So I thought I heard Bast Michael, what's up? I thought I heard Basti. You even sent out the final notice. Uh, Mike is just coming on. He'll be on in a second. Sebastian, are you out there? Participants. I guess I could look there. Huh? You just invited me, not Sebastian. Just, yeah, just a second ago. I know. I was. Does not look like Sebastian. 
Well, and, and, and I'm, I'm going to sign off at one anyway. Um, um, unless unless Sebastian doesn't show up and you need a third a third member. I can I'll text Bashi, but I'll invite him. Send that's one last thing. Bashi, Sebastian, computer crash. We'll be there in two minutes. That's where Bashi is. Sounds good. Ah, Sebastian just joined us. Awesome. So, sorry, guys, my uh, computer crashed. No worries. Uh, waiting on one more uh, to join, and then we'll be ready to go. Okay, I'm here. All right. Hey, Micah. How you doing? Fine. All right. Um, are you guys ready for me to get started? All good? Uh, Travers, Basti, and Micah, just let me know when you're ready for me to get started. Yeah, no. oh, I'm fine. Ready? Ready. All right, let's, let's do it. All right. Um, let me make sure I have this cursor ready. Yep, we're good to go. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. I am Michael Tatum, and today I'll be presenting my uh, master's thesis defense on communications coverage in unknown underground environments. Before I get started, I'd like to thank my thesis committee, Professor Matt Travers, the chair, and my advisor, Professor Seth, Sebastian Shearer, and Michael Cora, the PhD on my committee. So as some of you know, for the past several years, I've been working on the uh, DARPA Subterranean Challenge where we're creating communications networks underground in order to communicate with our robots. And this is the way we do it. We drop them out of the back of our large robots. And as you can see, this is kind of the distribution we're seeing with nodes dropped where the cyan dots in this image represent where nodes are dropped in the environment. As you can see, they're pretty spread out, few, far, and in between, um, and a lot are in the, like, the upper areas. And that's due to us dropping based on different metrics such as uh, received signal strength and line of sight. So there's some definitely some suboptimal placement with our radio transceivers in the environment trying to keep constant communications. So let's go a little higher level for a second. Uh, communications, they're everywhere around us and they're really immediate, especially in this day and age of you know, the, the pandemic and everything. We wanna have information as fast as possible and connections between people in our hospitals and in our, uh, with our doctors and our nurses. And they're overall pretty reliable nowadays, above ground, because of our satellites, because of GPS. But when we go underground, it's completely untraversed territory. We don't um, have a set up infrastructure like we have above ground for communication. And a lot of times the environment is unknown. We don't know uh, necessarily where we're going in the environment. We don't know how large the environment is. And there are also large communication barriers due to um, thick walls, whereas in an office environment, you can eat, uh, radio signals can easily transmit through the walls. So that is our main challenge here with providing communications underground. And we kind of were able to pursue this because of the DARPA subterranean challenge, working on that alongside this. This is a challenge we've been doing for the past two years where we send groups of autonomous vehicles into unknown underground environments. Thus far, they've been around 90 to 400 square meters. And uh, our task is to identify and localize artifacts, uh, specifically things like fire extinguishers, uh, survivors, backpacks, we want to localize those in the environment, as well as sending back point clouds of the environment uh, in real time. And in order to do that, we have to have communications with our robots in the environment. There are three types of uh, circuits that we've worked in. We uh, actually won the tunnel circuit back in August. We got second place in the urban circuit back in February, and the uh, cave circuit is coming up in uh, October. And then th these all uh, culminate in one grand challenge that'll be next summer that are all three environments together. And Overall, in most of these competitions, it's around a one hour long competition run. So we're sending out our, our robots and they're traversing the environment and sending back the data all within a one hour time span. So there's limited time within which we need to have constant communications. So to give you a little more background, here's a video I made post the uh, cave, or the, sorry, the tunnel circuit back in August. And this is kind of sh talking, showing our applications, what we actually have in the field. We work at Oregon State University, and again, we're, uh, we're Team Explorer uh, as our team, and this was the competition we actually won. We're sending out our large 400, 500 pound ground robots. Each of them carry, uh, can carry nine nodes, and nodes are the radio transceivers we're dropping in the environment to establish this network. 
uh, you're seeing now with drones. So we're sending about both drone and ground vehicles all on the same network, all connected through our mesh network we develop in the environment as we're moving through. As you can see, we're capable of moving through very difficult uh, environments, very rough terrain over uh, different environments, which means we need to provide communications to these environments as well. There's really nowhere with our robots we can't go within, within reason, but the problem is how can we talk to the robots if we are in a situation where we don't know what we wanna do with the robot? We wanna have those communications so that the operator, because there's a single operator in this competition, can uh, relay information to the robot as well as receiving the information we need, specifically artifact detections as you're seeing here, where we're localizing, in that example, a, a fire extinguisher, at both localizing and identifying that um, object. So you're seeing it's, uh, and th this is uh, an image of the uh, GUI we're working with, and this is only really a value if the user has communications to the robot in the field, so they're able to control um, if we go into a soft e-stop state, if we want the robots to move, Again, these are multi-agent systems also, so there's that added complexity. And if we can limit the complexity of communications, it will overall help our single base station operator. And there's our final photo of uh, when we won the tunnel circuit, so that was a good day. Uh, so now that you have a background on um, what the DARPA challenge is and why we're kind of doing this research, I'm gonna go a little more in depth on the background that's promoting the specific research we're doing here. So different communications approaches, uh, different teams in the DARPA challenge. We have teams from uh, JPL to MIT, um, all over the world, in fact, that are doing different communications approaches with their robots in the uh, DARPA sub challenge. Some are doing tethering, where they have a very long ethernet cable attached to their robot, send the robot out, it's unspooled as the robot moves through the environment. That gives very reliable communications, but it has the added um, uh, stipulation that they can only go as far as the ethernet cable, but also it doesn't create a network within which many robots can move. So each robot would have to have its own ethernet cable and it would be difficult to share information among robots. So it's not creating a truly connected network. Another approach some teams take is a data mulling robot. So they'll send out the robots that have very limited communications. They'll, they know they're gonna lose communications with that robot and they'll send out a smaller data mulling robot that will go and get in communications range with a robot in the field then bring that information back. Issue with that is it's a huge bottleneck that robot, uh, the data mulling robot gets stuck in the environment or is unable to traverse a certain area, then you've lost communications and you have to bring all your robots back to get your information back. This is why we create a mobile ad hoc network or MANE as I will call it henceforth, uh, which is essentially where we're laying nodes or radio transceivers disguised as nodes, um, those green objects in the environment. And then, um, and then it creates a mesh network within which uh, messages can be passed any way, any way, shape, or form through a network as long as there's a constant chain of communication. And it'll choose overall, in a, in a successful MNA, it'll choose the path of least resistance. It'll choose, for example, this red path that um, is an easiest path for all of our messages to get through. And we're sending back, again, point clouds and artifact detections from the robot to the base station. And then we're sending back commands from the base station to the robots. So a little bit more about our MNA. So you can see in the top right, that is a 3D drawing of the nodes that we use. We have a radio transceiver uh, inside the nodes. I'll get into the specific car where we're using a little later. But then we have in each, row, in each of our larger robots, our 500 pound robots, R1 and R2, they can hold nine nodes that we're dropping throughout the environment to develop this network. And then R3 can hold six nodes that will drop. So we have a total of 24 nodes to deploy in these environments. And again, as I was saying, uh, depending on cave, tunnel, or urban, they're all different size environments and we're not necessarily going to be getting full coverage in the environment. So we have to um, place nodes such a way that we can uh, cover as much of the environment and key areas of the environment as possible in a connected manner. Thus far, we've been using what I like to call the naive approach to drop nodes, which is dropping nodes based on the uh, received signal strength indicator, which is the uh, signal strength metric between a client device and um, and, and a node dropped in the environment. And then we're all, we drop based on that. So if the signal strength is low enough, we would drop a node, but also based on line of sight. If the agent or the robot is out of line of sight with a node that's already dropped, we know the signal's gonna deteriorate. So we would drop a node in that situation. Here's some data to back those claims up. You can see um, as we're moving through this environment over this test, over the time steps, we're moving actually. So the, uh, the green dot in those two bottom images represent the base station where there's a node placed and the red dot represents the agent moving through the environment. As we move through the environment and over time, the R society deteriorates because over distance, the uh, received signal strength indicator metric. But also we can see that as we go out of line of sight, the um, signal strength does deteriorate, but in fact, there's actually a spike um, in the uh, 600 time step 
uh, represented by the red dashed line in the, the second red dashed line in the above graph. So you can see that even though we're out of line of sight in this situation, we're actually receiving higher signal strength. So line of sight is not a completely perfect metric to say we should be dropping nodes. Also notice that the uh, RSSI values in the, in the top graph are pretty noisy. So if we just gave a hard cutoff of drop when this RSSI gets this low, we'd be dropping far too many nodes. And again, we have a limited number of nodes. And here's another uh, kind of example of why this is uh, th this would cause poor performance. Line of sight um, can also be unreliable and cause node piling. As you can see in the, in the top image on the right, uh, if we move through this environment, the agents moved through this environment and went in all the corners of the uh, shape you're seeing here, it would actually drop nodes because it would lose line of sight. It would drop four nodes in those environments. It would still cover the entire environment, but it would drop four nodes just as easily as it would drop one node in the center because we have no global view of the environment. So we're just dropping line of sight. And then again, also another um, kind of deterioration of the naive approach is that it has no uh, concept of frontiers or potential open areas. So it would drop a node just as easily in a dead end area as it would in an area leading to potential greater, um, greater coverage areas as you're seeing in the bottom image. So our goal is to go from this naive approach of dropping based on line of sight and RSSI values to a um, more optimal approach where we can drop nodes that are still in a connected network, but that we can drop fewer nodes to cover the entire environment as you're seeing in the uh, on the bottom right. So we wanna create a robust Monet in any environment, these tunnel cave and urban environments, as well as a combination of those and that are known or unknown. Because again, we're going to these environments and we don't know the environment going in. So how do we create maximum coverage in the environment in an unknown environment? So now that you have a background on what we're trying to accomplish here, I'm gonna go into the, challenge, the specific challenges and the contributions we've made in this work that we'll be seeing moving forward. First challenge, I was talking about how we, uh, we have no um, global knowledge of the entire map. That's where map prediction comes in. So we want to be able to go from, this is an image of the SATSOP urban environment we worked in back in February, where we have, when we started at the start gate, you're seeing in the bottom left, we only had that knowledge of the environment. How do we get from that knowledge to a full knowledge of the environment so that we can do uh, more precise node, node placement to limit node placement as well as cover more area? Uh, again, this is one of our main challenges. How do we do this map prediction step? Very complex, you can see in this kind of map, very specific map, but if we can do any type of map prediction, we predict that it will improve how we place nodes. And then secondly, how do we improve the node placement? Once we've predicted the map, the map properly or as close as we can, how do we place nodes in such a way that they're spread evenly, do maximum coverage, and place the least number of nodes possible? So our contributions is we have created a, uh, a way to maximize communications coverage with our current agent exploration model, but also when it's modular to different agent exploration models. So we're not limiting uh, just our approach for placing nodes to the current agent exploration model because that's constantly evolving in our work. We've also created a unique greedy connected coverage solution based on some other uh, more optimal maximum coverage solutions, but one that creates a connected network for our sensor nodes, because again, we want all the nodes we place to be connected in one MANA, one network. We also do experimental analysis on the maps and networks we work with, and a, a comparison of our new node placement approach to the naive approach, which we've talked about previously. And now that you know more about the challenges and contributions, I'm gonna address each of those individually in our approach section, saying how we're addressing those. And the approach section, just to give you a little more information, we'll be going over specifically the hardware and software we're using for this. You have more background on the approach we've taken, but also the methods we're using to uh, better predict maps as well as improve sensor coverage. So the hardware we're using, as I said, uh, we're using the Ragent DX2s, which you can see in the top right, the uh, blue radio transceiver. Uh, the, we were previously using the Ubiquiti nodes, which are uh, just off the shelf, uh, pretty cheap nodes that people place for Wi-Fi connectivity in uh, more like office environments. They're not made optimally for uh, underground environments, definitely not for that. Also not made really for dynamic meshes where the nodes are moving throughout the environment as you drop them. It doesn't work well with the dynamic environment. We'll see that moving forward. But the Ragent nodes are made specifically actually for drones, so which are constantly moving. Michael, I think you muted yourself. Michael, I think you muted yourself. 
Uh, Matt, is that right? I, I can't hear Michael anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't hear Same you. Hold on, yeah, I got muted, but uh, yeah, no, I definitely don't hear him. It doesn't appear that he is muted. It looks like <laughs> it, it could be a, a loss of the internet connection on his side. I, I have a red microphone icon. Yeah. No, so he usually calls in, I think, is the thing. Yeah, so he has two Michael Tatums. One's his camera, the other yeah. one, there's, there's the camera no one. photo or anything. Oh, okay, okay. Camera Michael is still alive. <laughs> oh, although he might be frozen in that position. All right, let me just uh, try to give him a call, maybe. When I've, when I've had calls with him, he's had internet connection issues on occasion. So that's probably what's going on. But the video is working pretty good. I'm back now. Okay. Sorry, my Zoom went down. Really sorry. Thanks, you guys are... Yes, we can All hear right. you. Cool. Yeah, I don't know why that happened. I'm connected to Ethernet, but things happen. All right, can you see, see the screen now? Yes. Do you think you had some communications issues? The, uh, possibly, but I'm connected through Ethernet, so I did all I could. All right, we good to go? Yep. Great. All right. Sorry about that, guys. So I um, was going into why um, we're choosing the Ragent DX2 nodes. So another reason is a uh, higher TX power so it can go much farther. So we're not saying, again, uh, I was talking about how we don't really need to be line of sight with these nodes because they have higher transmit power than we had with Ubiquities. Also, they'll go further. Um, the max range is significantly further than Ubiquities. Again, that's for optimal environments, as you can see by the asterisk. Uh, we're not seeing that same distance in our environments, but overall, still a better node in general. And then finally, um, the, it, the smaller form factor, lighter weight, better for our drones. That was another huge reason why we chose the DX2s. The software, we're using the InstaMesh meshing protocol, which is uh, proprietary to Ragent. Uh, this is a completely distributed protocol, meaning that if we have, uh, like, let's say 10 nodes placed in an environment, if one node is removed, the uh, Ragent mesh will remesh for us in order to create an optimal configuration even with that missed node. So there's no, no um, like leader node. All the nodes are completely independent so that we can create a network that has repeatability in our environments. And that's one of the main uh, things we try to do with our network we set up so that there's no single point of failure. Uh, overall, also another reason the InstaMesh network is, has much more reliable meshing than we had with the uh, Ubiquity nodes using the Batman meshing protocol. One of the things we had to do with the, Insta, the Ubiquity nodes was only turn on nodes as we drop them in the environment. And the main issue with that was that it added a lot of complexity, uh, but also was not nearly as reliable because just uh, using a Hall effect sensor to turn on nodes was, had a variable reliability. Radio performance. So based on what we did at the uh, urban circuit and how far away we placed nodes, the maximum distance we had between two nodes, even though they weren't line of sight, but still connected was represented by the one circled in the image on the right. It was roughly 50 meters apart. So moving forward, we said, said a safe assumption for working underground environments was around thir a 30 meter node range of each node in the environment. Maximum distance between nodes, roughly 60 meters. Again, they can go further, but because we're working in highly variable environments with a lot of debris and a lot of uh, thick walls that are more difficult to pass through, but you can go around as you can see in this environment, we thought uh, that the 30 meter range was appropriate. So in order to test all of, um, of our approaches in simulation, we had to generate maps. Do, to do that, we used uh, John Conway's Game of Life, which essentially says if you have a free cell in the environment, the likelihood of that remaining free is dependent upon its neighbors. In the environment, it's its way of generating uh, different maps and seeing how cells uh, evolve over time. So by changing the, uh, the number of surrounding cells that need to be free or open, uh, you can change the type of maps that are generated. So we generated the cave maps, which are uh, representative of caves such as Laurel Caverns, where you have large open basins, but also thin hallways and walls leading to those. So very variable, uh, natural environment. And we have the eight urban environments, which are much more open, such as a subway station or a, or a nuclear facility, where there's debris spread throughout, but it's significantly more open. And then the tunnel environments, which are very thin hallways, a lot of different branches in the environment, uh, similar to what you'd see in a maze. And then the hybrid environment is representative of what we'll be seeing in the Grand Challenge, where the first third of the columns is the cave environment, second third is the urban environment, and final third is the tunnel environment. So these are the type of maps we'll be using moving forward. So map prediction, I was talking about how we wanna get a global view of the map, know the entire map, at least based on prediction to get more optimal sensor coverage. So to do that, inspired by some of the work of Jeff Hollinger, we 
uh, create, used a convolutional neural net because this is ideal for large data sets of images. And we're passing in arrays, um, 32 by 32 arrays specifically of maps representative of images. And specifically the uh, CNN we're using as a unit, we're also using image in painting, which I'll be getting into to calculate our losses to improve training over time. So specifically the unit, uh, it, it, what's unique about the unit is it's a symmetrical uh, network. So the first half, the encoding half is used for a classification of an image. So for example, if we had um, uh, an array of pictures of dogs and we wanted to classify if a dog was in an image, this is the layer that would train on images of dogs to, if you pass an image of a dog through the network, it would be able to classify that there's a dog in that image. But the really cool part about unit is that the second half is used for localization in an image. So it won't only tell you if there's an image, if there's a dog in an image, but it'll tell you where that dog is located. This is ideal for us because like I was talking about the cave environments, we not only want to identify that there might be a basin in a certain area, but we want to say localize where that basin is to give us more accurate map prediction. And here's an example of what our map prediction, act, our unit actually looks like. So we'll be passing in that middle image, which is the uh, percentage explored map or percentage we know of the map passing that in and then the uh, lighter cells in the unit map output will be the cells that are more likely to be free cells. So as you can see, it's accurately predicting that in the bottom left and bottom right, we have certain areas and caverns where there's free area. And overall, even though the prediction is not completely accurate, it'll give us a better idea of certain frontiers or uh, barriers between, open, um, between known cells and, and unknown open cells to determine where we should be placing nodes. So then image in painting. This is where we take an image such as one on the bottom left where certain parts have been taken out and we fill it in based on the surrounding pixels, creating smoothness in an image. And this image was taken uh, from testing last week. So map prediction specifically, um, two of the main, uh, this calculates again our per pixel losses. So what the losses we're using to actually train the network, two of the main losses are the loss hole and loss valid. Loss hole, if you look at the uh, second image on the bottom, this is our masked image, which takes um, the percentage explored image and creates a mask around the areas that we know aren't potential frontiers that we know that have walls surrounding them. And then we are predicting the rest of the image as you're seeing in the third image. And the lost hole is the difference between that predicted part of the image and the true ground truth part of the image. So overall, this loss is gonna be a little bit higher because we're working in highly variable environments. Loss valid is based on um, the difference between the percentage explored area that's predicted in the third image and the true percentage explored area because this is still a prediction. So that'll be a much smaller loss, but it's still a loss nonetheless that helps us in our training. And then finally, these all come together to, um, so we're passing uh, our percent explored maps, the second image at the, on the top through the unit to give us our, our uh, unit predicted map, the bottom left. And then we're using image in painting to compare the, uh, the predicted area to the, uh, the known area in the output image, or the known area in the ground truth image to the predicted area in the output image. And then we're training this on actually 500,000 iterations to better predict our maps for all types of environments. Once we've predicted the map, we need to figure out how do we optimally place nodes or, or near optimally place nodes in these environments, specifically using the uh, maximum coverage algorithm. Which, which maximizes the number of covered elements with a limited number of sets. Like I said, we have a limited number of nodes in these environments. So how do we optimize or, or cover as much of the uh, free open area that could be covered in communications as possible? The example given below is of, uh, we're trying to cover as many of those blue dots as possible with only 20 sets, which are represented by the red dots with a fixed range, the black circles. And this is the optimal solution. The problem with the maximum coverage problem is it's NP hard and we need to solve this problem in polynomial time because we wanna solve this in real time as the agents move into the environment. And as we try to drop more nodes, it, it NP hard problem would be uh, more problematic. So that brings us to the greedy maximum coverage problem, which iteratively solves maximum coverage by taking in uh, a, a set of dot or an array of dots, such as the one you're seeing here that we wanna cover with sets represented by the circles we would iteratively, constructively approximate the optimal within actually one minus one over E, and we're solving it in polynomial time. So that, that's the main takeaway. So as you can see in the final um, output of the coverage with three sets, we're not covering as much as possible, but again, we're doing this in polynomial time. So this is the approach we need to take for our approach, as well as for any approaches sub T, uh, the Team Explorer takes moving forward.
And then finally, for our um, simulation specifically, we need to have a way of doing frontier exploration that was simple so that we can modularize our uh, node placement approach to any type of frontier exploration we actually do. Again, frontiers are the barrier between a uh, known area in the environment and unknown free cells in the environment. So y the Yamauchi approach specifically is what we're using, which finds the nearest frontier. And we use that A star um, to find that in, rather than Manhattan or Euclidean to distance because in our highly variable environments, there's a lot of areas that could lead to running into walls and such. And we wanna make sure the actual path, the nearest path to the nearest frontier that's calculated is truly the nearest and we wouldn't have to go around a wall and it would actually be much farther than we anticipated and it prevents us from getting stuck in the environments. But the one change we've made to the Amalchi method for our purposes is uh, that node placement is prioritized. So uh, when we need to drop a node in order to maintain communications in the environment, we will change Amalchi such that it, it chooses the uh, new node location where we're gonna drop a node as the next frontier and then it'll proceed with the Amalchis as normal. So now that you know the approaches we're taking to actually uh, conduct this research, I'll go into the results, specifically how we're doing the simulation, what kind of environments we're working in, and the uh, results we've gotten from testing in different environments with different approaches. So first, uh, I'd want to talk about map predictions, so our training and validation losses. Overall, as you can see, these are the losses from image inpainting, where, um, especially with the loss total uh, figure F. You're seeing that around 100,000 iterations, we are uh, plateauing. So we've learned how to predict these maps as well as possible. The one thing of note is the uh, loss hole, which again is that loss based on the predicted area and the predicted area alone, the unknown area. So um, that, that again was gonna be more highly variable because of our highly variable environments. And that's why you're seeing a little more overfitting there. We played around with these parameters. This is the best performance we got, but there's still room for improvement. We believe in our map prediction because of this uh, loss hole error and where we're seeing a little bit of overfitting. In the simulation we're working in, we're working in a 32 by 32 grid world uh, where each cell is 10 square meters. So that means that we have a 320 square meter grid world. And as I said previously, the worlds we've worked in thus far are from 90 square meters, like the urban circuit environment to um, the set to the uh, Bruce and mine environment, which is roughly 400 square meters. So we want to choose something in between that would be representative of, of all environments. Um, the node range we're using in the environment is three cells, which means there's a 70 square meter set. There's a 30 meter range around a node. As you can see in the bottom, the uh, yellow cells represent the coverage by a maroon node placed in the environment. This is considering that all the areas surrounding the node are in fact free because you won't get um, coverage in an occupied cell. You wouldn't travel that regardless. Um, but again, we want to create a connected network. So we want uh, there to be a chain of nodes or a fully connected mane of nodes. Either way, it's fully connected network that we're placing in the environment. That's why we're doing this uh, greedy coverage, um, but a greedy coverage that's modified to be connected in the environment. We're also only dropping five nodes in each environment because in a completely free map where we could drop nodes anywhere, we're, we'd only cover about a fourth of uh, the completely free map. And we wanted to see how, um, how uh, not optimally, but how, um, how much maximum coverage we get when we place nodes in an environment where we know we won't get, mac we won't get complete coverage. So to do that, we, act, we only drop five nodes. And the agent observation radius is one cell, so 10, 10 square meters, uh, or 30 square meters, 10 meter range. And uh, the reason for this is because the uh, range radius, uh, or the node radius is much farther than like, for example, our uh, LIDAR radius or our camera radius. So we wanted to keep that as accurate as possible. And finally, in every simulation we run, we drop a base station node at the origin. This is uh, akin to us having a base station node where the operator is in the environment. So this node drop does not count as one of our five nodes to drop, but its coverage does count towards total cell coverage, which is a metric we'll get into moving forward. So to give you an idea of how the simulation works, this is just a uh, kind of a toy example of a cave environment generated where the agent represented by the uh, green cell is moving through the environment. And then when it get, and the purple cells are the prediction, the predicted map of the environment, light purple represents and dark purple are the same in the agent's eyes. The dark purple just shows that this is an incorrect prediction where an occupied cell actually is. As it moves to the environment and learns more of the environment, because the observed area is the white cells, it will improve its predictions. And then finally, the yellow cells represent, once it's dropped its final node, we end the simulation, it drops its fifth node, and the yellow cells that you saw represented uh, how much of the area was covered. So this is just to give you an idea of what we're dealing with. Specifically, we did had different approaches. The greedy connected solution we used was for comparison to all the other approaches we took because we want to see 
what is using greedy connected coverage the best solution we could get? And again, this greedy connected coverage is using the uh, greedy maximum coverage algorithm, but maintaining connection between all nodes as you see in the image on the right. For the greedy connected solution, uh, we're not in fact actually moving the agent to the environment, we're just starting at the base station location, uh, but we have full grid world knowledge. So this is not what we would be seeing in the DARPA challenge, but we wanted to see again, if we knew the entire environment, how well could we place these nodes? And this will be used for comparison moving forward. The prediction approach is the approach that takes all of the uh, approaches, uh, all of the uh, methods I talked about in the approach section and combines them into one uh, node placement approach. So it takes our map prediction where you're seeing with the purple cell just predicting the map. It uses sensor coverage or greedy connected coverage to place nodes. And then it uses frontier exploration to move through the environment. Again, we have limited knowledge of the environment. We only know what the agent has observed, which is why you're seeing some map predictions that aren't completely true to the true map, but as it would move, they would improve. Um, and then we're also seeing that uh, some node placements, it's, it covers 86% of the coverage that we cover with the Greedy Connected solution. And the main reason for this is you're seeing some placements in areas that aren't exactly the same as Greedy Connected. And that's because we're following the Amalchis and have partial uh, knowledge of the map. So we're placing as best we can with the knowledge of the map we have, as well as with the predictions we made on the map. We wanted to also evaluate uh, how valuable is prediction. So we did uh, the same approach with the prediction approach, but we took out the prediction steps. So we were still using greedy connected sensor coverage and frontier exploration to move for the environment, but we took out prediction. And that leaves us with two uh, possibilities. We could either do a pessimistic approach or an optimistic approach. A pessimistic approach says every cell the agent is unaware of in the environment is closed. It's a cell I cannot go into. Therefore, the only cells where I could be placing nodes are cells I've explored. That's why you're seeing in the top right image where it's placing nodes just along walls, very suboptimally. You're only getting like half the coverage you could potentially get. It's only covering 65% of what's covered with the greedy connected solution. So we also want to try the optimistic approach that says every cell I'm unaware of is in fact a free cell, a cell where I could be placing a node. This leads it to explore much more of the environment, but also cover a lot more of the environment because it is free to move throughout the environment because it has an optimistic worldview of the environment. Again, no predictions being done uh, but it, it, the uh, optimistic approach is akin to doing prediction and saying that every cell has 100% probability of being free. But again, optimistic is truly no prediction. And then finally, the naive approach. This is dropping simply based on line of sight and uh, RSSI range. Uh, just in, in our simulation, we did that based on distance. So if you go six nodes, uh, because the range between two nodes can be six cells, if you go six cells apart from another node, you drop a node, or if you're out of line of sight and have, and we gave it a tire, tighter threshold of range, because we, one change we did to make in uh, Team Explorer to, um, to limit the number of line of sight drops we had was to just make a tighter threshold or a stricter range of how far the agent can be from a node out of line of sight. So we made that T over two. And so it can still go out of line of sight in this case, but not nearly as far. As you can see, it's still hugging the walls, following the mouchies. There's no map prediction. There's no increased exploration and it's dropping nodes suboptimally as we'd expected with the naive approach. So I'm gonna get into uh, comparing all of these approaches. Uh, we did 100 maps on each test for each approach for each map type. So we did the cave maps, the urban maps, the tunnel maps that I generated as I showed you and all map types, which is a combination of all three together. And then the metrics we'll be looking at are the number of cells covered by the um, nodes placed, the number of cells explored by the agent, the node distance, which is the distance between, uh, for example, the first node drop with the predicted prediction approach and the first node drop with the greedy connected solution approach. And it's the difference between that and it's averaged over all consecutive drops, as you can see in the equation given here. And then we're also comparing time of simulation. Hey, Michael, I have a point of clarification. Sure. <clears throat> so the cells explored, since you're not doing necessarily exploration so much as you know, uh, communications planning, uh, it would be the cells explored before running out of nodes, correct? Yes, that is correct. Yeah, it's, it's the cells explored because again, the simulation ends when we run out of nodes and in the same kind of way, the DARPA challenge in a way kind of ends when we run out of comms because we have no idea where the robot is or where it's going. Got it, so the comms, like, and the actual exploration strategy are indeed decoupled, but that is the way in which you're making this relevant. Correct. Understood. Thank you. 
So first, let's look at the uh, results for the uh, prediction versus no prediction approaches. That is the uh, prediction approach I talked about previously and the uh, pessimistic approach without prediction, no prediction pessimistic, and no prediction optimistic. So first, when we look at percent coverage of the environment, we're seeing overall more coverage with the prediction approach, but it's very close to the coverage we're getting with the optimistic approach. Again, this is due to, um, to a lot of similarities in terms of uh, with our prediction approach, we tend to lean towards cells being free that we're unaware of. The same way the optimistic approach just says every cell I'm unaware of is free. That's why you're seeing more exploration needs, but also more coverage because we're placing in more optimal areas. Uh, we see that we also want to look at the average path length of the robot because we don't want to increase path length with our dropping scheme. We don't want to move throughout the environment. And that's one way in which the prediction approach in most of the maps actually improved upon no prediction optimistic is that and no prediction optimistic because it's considering every cell free it moves in a lot of different areas in the environment it doesn't follow a really a logical path because it just goes to the, it considers every cell free so the uh, potential node placements it calculates are in any area of the environment as opposed to a better map prediction which says it's in a more logical area so that's another reason that we are seeing more exploration with the uh, no prediction optimistic approach but it's also increasing our uh, robot path overall which is unideal because we want to keep the robot path where we would want it as opposed to where um, the nodes necessarily say it to go. Also the node distance. So again, this is that node distance metric I talked about. Overall, we're getting more accurate placements to the greedy connected solution with the prediction approach. And then finally, the biggest trade-off we've seen in this work is that the uh, time of simulation is significantly increased. This is both due to the map prediction step in the prediction approach, but also due to increased exploration. If we're seeing more in the environment, the uh, agent is not ending the simulation until it's dropped its final node. Therefore, it's, um, it, it increases the time of the simulation. So overall, it's not really a bad thing because we want to explore more in the environment, but the map prediction, as I said, does increase the amount of time of a simulation. So what we really wanted to also look at was how does our prediction approach we're proposing the team explore compared to the naive approach. So as you can see in these uh, graphs, significant improvement over the naive approach. Uh, averaged or normalized over the greedy connected solution, significant more coverage, uh, over 20% more for all map types, including the combined map types over the naive approach. So that's definitely significant improvement. That's what we wanted to see with this research. So we're very happy with those metrics. Uh, cells explored before the uh, simulation ends, significantly more than the naive approach. We're seeing more of the environment before we run out of nodes. That is promising for us moving into the subtly challenge where we can see more of the environment in one uh, connected network with the same number of nodes as we would have previously, but we're seeing more of the environment. A much greater accuracy with the uh, prediction approach. Uh, overall, there's a much, a much smaller margin between where we're placing nodes with the greedy connected solution and where we're placing them with the prediction um, approach. But again, there's that trade-off of the time of simulation. So time is significantly increased both by increased exploration before we end the run, but also by that prediction step and the um, greedy maximum coverage um, calculation, the greedy connected coverage calculation, because we have to make sure that where we would potentially drop nodes is connected to other drop nodes in the environment, which takes significant time because you have to also consider uh, barriers that you've observed in the environment. Finally, one other uh, metric we wanted to look at was uh, how, do, how does uh, performing on a certain map type compare uh, align with the certain map types that we're being trained on. So again, we trained different map types in our uh, UNET architecture, and this is the normalized um, coverage over the greedy connected solution using the predicted approach. What you'd expect is that the map type you're testing on, it performs better on the, uh, um, the same kind of map type that's trained on. Overall, we see that slightly, we see slightly better performance on that diagonal there. But one of the main takeaways we actually took from this was that the urban environments get the highest percentage of coverage and this is due to the, the open nature of the urban environments. Because they're more open, any node placement you give has a higher likelihood of covering more area. So that's why we're seeing that higher performance with the urban environments. So now I'm going to show you a demo of uh, specifically with the uh, SATSOP environment. This is a model, a 32 by 32 model of the SATSOP environment worked in back in February. I'm going to show you how the greedy connected solution compares to the naive approach and the prediction approach. The greedy connected solution you're seeing here, we actually changed the scaling of the map. So as opposed to each cell being, we changed it by a third. So each cell, instead of being 10 square meters, is now 3.33 square meters. This allows the entire 32 by 32 map to be around 100 square meters, 
which is more akin to that 90 square meter satsop uh, map I showed you at the beginning. Uh, the node range is now nine cells, which is still, still 30 square meters, but we've uh, just increased the range so it makes sense for us. And then the available nodes we have is four because as you can see in the greedy connected solution, we're getting complete coverage with only four nodes uh, dropped in this environment. So now I'm gonna show you how the naive approach does compared to the greedy connected solution. So we have the agent moving through the environment. We have the white cells that represent what has been explored, drops nodes as it goes either line of sight with a tight threshold or out of range, drops its final node. And that is the coverage it has. It's 64% covered and has not explored the entire environment. So let's now see how the prediction approach works in the same environment. So we're moving through the environment, uh, again, using the amount to explore the environment. We drop a node, when we get out of range, we recalculate where we should be placing nodes. We recalculate where we should be placing nodes, move through the environment, continue to predict the environment as we're moving through the environment. As we observe more of the environment, find where more walls are, our predictions will improve. But again, also the SATSOP, mine, or the SATSOP urban environment is a difficult, not tradi non-traditional environment. So the environments trained on were more open. They never had the perfect circles in the middle. But overall, we're happy with this prediction because it's leading to a uh, more optimal placement, more akin to the greedy connected solution, as you can see. To finish off, and then we have our final coverage and exploration. So we explored the entire environment, and we have 97% of the greedy connected, but also of the entire environment covered, still dropping only four nodes. So now that you've seen the demo, you've seen our results based on this work and how the prediction approach actually improves upon what we've done previously. I'm gonna go into conclusion we can take from this and the future work we wanna pursue. So first of all, uh, we did what we wanted to do. We went from that naive approach where we were getting only 64% covered and went to that prediction approach where we were getting very near to that greedy connected solution coverage while maintaining connection to the network and limiting the number of nodes. So the prediction approach based on this improves the communications coverage, as you can see, the exploration while being in communications and the placement accuracy to the greedy connected solution because ideally, we would have a fully known environment and we could just drop nodes as we uh, optimally in the environment. But because we only know a part of the environment and that knowledge is increasing, we have to get as close as possible to that greedy connected solution. We're also robust to different environments. We can work in the cave, urban, tunnel, and hybrid environments. Uh, we get very similar performance as you were seeing in that confusion matrix. And also we found that optimistic map prediction is best. If you have an optimistic worldview, you're gonna have better uh, map prediction because you're gonna more likely lead you towards frontiers where you place a node and get more maximum coverage. Future works, um, we would like to increase map prediction scrutiny because based on the results you saw where the prediction approach and the no prediction optimistic approaches had very similar results. And again, this is because they both have a pretty optimistic worldview saying that if I don't know a cell, there's a higher, with the no prediction optimistic approach, it says it will definitely be a free cell. Whereas the prediction approach, the soft max function generate, generalizes towards it being open because we wanna explore these new frontiers and see more of the environment. But if we increase that scrutiny, we might see a bigger separation and more accurate map predictions. Also, um, we wanna improve the prediction approach computation time. Uh, again, you saw how the uh, prediction approach increases computation time because of the uh, greedy connected coverage problem as well as the map prediction. I think we can definitely decrease the uh, greedy connected coverage problem uh, computation time because we're doing a star over the grid world many times in order to figure out if there's actually a path between where a node is placed to connection with an arc to uh, with a potential node placement that increases time significantly because we're doing that for every potential node placement. Uh, and I think we can limit that. Also, um, we, we want to answer the question, what if we're working in unknown map sizes? So we've been working with 32 by 32 grids throughout this entire test, but going into the DARPA challenge, we don't know the entire uh, world going in. So it could be growing. And that's where we uh, wanted to look at, possibly look at factor graphs, where we can dynamically grow the graph in real time, where each node in the graph represents essentially a cell in our array. But instead of using an array, we're using these factor graphs. And as we move through the environment, we can grow this. And each cell is independent, except for dependence upon its neighboring cell with the variable nodes. Uh, as you can see in the image, you're seeing the circles represent factor nodes and the uh, squares represent variable nodes, which are the dependencies between um, neighboring nodes. So if we work with factor graphs, we might be able to actually grow these graphs in real time and allow us to get these optimal solutions. But again, the only time we actually depend upon our map size is when we do um, map prediction. So we could also just potentially train our um, map, prediction map prediction neural net on different map sizes. 
Uh, before I finish, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank all the people who've made this possible over the years. Uh, this is just a fraction of the people, but these are people specifically in Team Explorer and Kevin uh, who have helped me throughout this journey and uh, helped me definitely over the past three months of quarantine uh, making this all possible. So thank you very much. And now I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> you clap anymore? Uh, cool. Uh, yeah. All right. So yeah. First and foremost, so Michael, thank my yeah, I'm muted. Uh, Michael, there. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, the, for the great talk. Uh, it's been really great, you know, working with you these last couple of years and seeing you go through this. Um, so yeah, just in the interest of time, I guess we'll sort of open it up for oh, getting licked. Uh, but uh, so we'll open it up to questions. Uh, so I don't know the protocol, but I'm going to just go with Micah. Let's go. It's going to be the all grad student day Start with you and uh, we'll go from there. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, yeah, so good talk. I really like how you're able to connect uh, the node placement and coverage problem to the, the very real application in the subterranean challenge. And it's been very interesting seeing that develop. Uh, so I'll start out, I think, at a, a high level. Uh, one thing I think I missed to some extent was exactly what challenges you encountered developing this work, like what was difficult to implement, uh, and also like what was most challenging. Yeah, uh, I think definitely the uh, map prediction uh, step was probably the most challenging because I was working off some work in Jeff Hollander's lab where they use that for predicting uh, tunnel environments, actually for the DARPA challenge as well. And those were very thin, narrow uh, tunnel environments, and I had to apply that to the much different grid worlds I was working with. Uh, the biggest challenge was both training that, but also taking those results and kind of almost using them uh, with a grain of salt in a way. So I also wanted to do my placement, not strictly based on um, just what was predicted, but also based on what I've learned of the environment. So that's why I did those um, like approaches without prediction where I was doing the optimistic and the pessimistic, which could definitely be a route if uh, for sub T to take moving forward. If map prediction proved to be either too complicated or not reliable enough, we might just say, let's just have an optimistic worldview, say where we should be dropping nodes. And if we try to traverse to that, that area of the environment and find that it's blocked off, we recalculate our um, greedy connected coverage based on the new, what the new areas we've learned of the environment as we traverse the environment. Okay. Um, uh, one other thing that I thought you might be able to reiterate was uh, if you could describe the naive approach quickly and yeah. uh, why it performed more poorly than the uh, prediction sure. based. Yeah, so we developed a naive approach back in, I want to say like this time last year, and we just did that to get something out. So essentially we said, we're going to drop nodes if the RSSI values, that signal strength indicator, gets poor enough. So if we're um, in an environment uh, where, um, where we've traveled far, far enough based on both distance, well, actually based on RSSI values. But we also added the ad stipulation because of the ubiquity nodes specifically that were poor in um, not line of sight conditions. We said, as soon as we go out of line of sight, we use ray casting to calculate that, we will drop a node. But again, in these highly complex environments, it actually would cause us to drop nodes in around every single corner because we'd lose line of sight very easily. So we added a stipulation with the line of sight that we had a tighter threshold. So let's say that the, uh, the threshold for dropping a node line of sight was negative 80 uh, dBm with our psi values. We would make it negative 60 dBm if it wasn't line of sight. So it could still go out of line of sight, but it had a tighter threshold for dropping a node. That would allow us to drop fewer nodes, but it still proved uh, like not really reliable metrics because of the noisiness with which we were getting our psi values. And also because there was no consideration of the, um, the entire global environment within which we could drop a cell just as easily with naive approach against a wall as we could in an open area leading to many hallways. And our goal throughout this research has been, how do we drop a node in areas that lead to many potential areas of coverage so that we can drop fewer nodes? 
Thanks. Uh, before we move on to the next question, so I suppose that highlights the, the risks as you start moving beyond line of sight and how you have to manage that in your model, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I have two more questions and I'll try to keep this quick. Uh, on slide 16? Uh, yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, something that I don't think had come up before and that you went over a little quickly. Uh, you talked about the system being modular with respect to exploration. Mm -hmm. uh, could you uh, tell me a little more about what you had in mind there? Yeah, so currently the uh, greedy connected coverage problem does not, the only way it affects exploration is we place, uh, we choose the, uh, the new node, if, if we calculate a new node placement, we choose that as the new frontier using Yamauchis. But again, that's the only change we make from Yamauchis and continue Yamauchis. So if we use a different um, agent exploration approach, we could still be using the same greedy connected coverage problem to choose where we're dropping nodes we would just change how we integrated that into the uh, frontier exploration approach. Thanks. Okay, so last question. One of the things I really like about uh, your results is you have a fairly critical set of uh, trials. You have the optimistic and pessimistic, uh, and then you also have the, the full knowledge version with the uh, greedy with knowledge of the map. Mm -hmm. And a number of interesting things come out of that. Like you have the uh, prediction approach coming in very close to optimistic mm -hmm. and small deviations there in the different environments. Mm -hmm. uh, but one thing I, I think that we haven't gone as uh, far into is how close the prediction and optimistic are to the full knowledge. And, and that seems to imply that you're, you're nearing uh, the limit of how well you can perform. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I believe that um, overall, we, again, we know in these environments that, uh, and most of them, because we have a limited number of nodes, we're not going to get full coverage. So that's why we want to get as close to Greedy Connected as possible. But we still definitely see areas in Greedy Connected where we might be able to uh, place even better than the Greedy Connected solution currently based on the environment that we know we might want to place uh, in areas that lead to more open basins as opposed to hallways because even though it's covering the same number of cells it could potentially lead to more open areas moving forward if we had more nodes so that, that kind of opens the question what if we had more nodes then we want to drop more optimally throughout the entire environment leading to the more open areas so i believe that also the greedy connected solution since it is not optimal that could still be improved and then we could see how the uh, prediction and no prediction optimistic compared to that moving forward. Okay, so, so to clarify real quick, uh, the, the next level of challenge is starting to re, uh, reason about the, the process over a much longer horizon, mm -hmm. uh, maybe like a POM DP with full uh, prediction of full maps so that you can reason not only about how like uh, the gain one like, uh, node placement can gain you, but also how that could give you access to uh, new areas r later on, which is a really exactly. hard challenge. And I think that's ex it's exciting that that's what we're talking about now. Yep, that's exactly. Okay, I think I'm, I'm done for now, I'll pass. Um, so I just had a little thing. I think your square uh, meter calculations aren't quite correct. I think that's uh, just a little thing. Uh, in the simulation squares, or, or the... I think o uh, overall, like when you're saying like 32 by 32 for 10 square meter cells, then that's like 10, like roughly 10,000 square meters or something like this. Uh, so just take a little thing. I, oh, I see. I see double what check those 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 numbers. Yeah. That's what you're saying. Um, and then, uh, so the so the other question I had is so uh, the performance uh, you had. Can you go back to the table where you highlight the different uh, like uh, results? Um, that one? Uh, no, back like the 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 table where you have like the 
so in this one, uh, actually, yeah, this one, I have a question on this one. So this one, the idea is coverage is how much connection coverage you have, right? Yes. How many free cells were in the, uh, in the connected area once the, uh, the simulation is finished? And that's normalized over the greedy connected solution. So it's, for the example, on the first cell 1-1, one, one, it's 87% of the greedy connected solution is covered by um, mm -hmm. doing a cave map using the cave net on over 100 maps. Okay, and then the greedy, so the greedy connected solution and your solution have the same number of nodes? Yes. But the greedy connected has access to the full map? Correct. Okay. And so do you, do you have a sense, do you always maintain connectivity to the base station here? Or can there be two, like for example, could you have two clusters of nodes that are connected? Uh, no, you'll never create an island of connection. It'll always be one central network connected back to the base station. Okay. Okay. And then uh, kind of, if you go back to the other table. Um, okay, so um, here the, so the time it takes you for the exploration, that doesn't really matter if it's good or bad, right? It's just like how much you actually move around. Correct. Do you ter terminate like the search if you can't keep it connected or what happens? Right. Um, and the main, the main reason we kind of kept these times is because there were many different times based on the map prediction time, uh, sensor coverage uh, to calculate the greedy connected coverage time. So the biggest spike you're actually seeing is, and I'll just so it's easier to see, is that map prediction time is, can add up to like 100 seconds per map with a prediction approach. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's actually calculation time. Yes. Uh, oh, yes, the, the calculation is what's adding that time as opposed to really anything else. Okay. And then uh, the other question, so this is over like a set of 100 experiments or something like this? Yes, averaged. So is, are any of the results just statistically significant? Or like what's, like for example, for the percentage covered like between 30 and 38 and 39, is that significant or is that within the margin of, of um it's, it, so this is that's not normalized over the uh greedy connected solution it would be much higher if it was uh so it's significant in that we're we're able to and again we're only dropping like five nodes so we know we won't get complete coverage so dropping for example uh getting 50 percent coverage is going to cover half of the map with only five nodes and as we've seen in the darpa challenge we have up to 24 nodes so we see that using much fewer nodes, we can get the higher coverage. So yeah, overall these results show, we're getting the results we definitely want. Well, so, so I guess what I'm asking more is um, to be able to compare between the, the different approaches, mm -hmm. you want to say, you know, is let's say that number 39, sure. like what's the error bar on that number versus the error bar on the number 38? Michael, you have this plot, right? Which is, uh the comparison of this with the error bars on it? Um, that is for between prediction and naive. So that, I think you're referring to this one. Is that what you're referring to? No, I feel like I've uh, many times looked at a plot with you, which is a comparison of at least naive, uh, pred no prediction optimistic. Oh, you're talking about the, um, oh, sorry, the, uh, the, Box and whisker plots. Yes, I do have those. Uh, they might be, I think I put them in the end, yeah. In the appendix. I, I didn't put them in the end, but I, I can definitely give those to you. They're, they're, I just did box and whisker plots over all of the data we've gotten. So you can see the average error. Uh, I don't, I just see appendix. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I don't have them in this slide. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> it's, it's figure 4.9 in the thesis. It's in the paper. 
Yeah, so Michael, do you want to just speak to that? So do you understand what that question is now? Yeah, it's just the like how how accurate like the percentage error I'm getting on that number, and overall, it's I'm getting the same percentage error on the different approaches I'm taking, uh, like in terms of versus greedy connected solution, but it's pretty centralized around uh, like 39% for that 39% value. I, I think the question, if I could rephrase it, might be, so between uh, no prediction pessimistic, no prediction optimistic, and your approach, mm -hmm. like the percentage covered, if I remember correctly, with the no prediction pessimistic, like the error bars around over your uh, 100 trials mm -hmm. on the average were such that like the no prediction optimistic uh, prediction your stuff were statistically much better than the uh, no prediction pessimistic, right? They were outside yes. of the error bars. So it was like, even on average, several standard deviations, they were statistically better, correct? Yes, yes that's correct. Understood. Yeah. Uh, but again, so for anyone, we can make this available to them who's listening to this discussion uh, and would like to see this box, uh, box and whisker plot. It is again uh, in the document itself, the thesis document itself. Yeah, I don't have any more questions. Uh, if you, anybody else wants to ask. Uh, yeah, so I've been, uh, just to finish up for the committee, I've been asking you questions for months. Uh, you know, I'm a huge fan of your work. Um, so yeah, nice uh, talk. I enjoyed watching it. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's, let's make it work on robots. Um, so uh, just in the interest of time, and it's 105, we're probably, uh, I guess five minutes probably past the hour, not probably, but um, so does anyone... Uh, in the crowd, I would probably opt to just go into discussions unless there's like a burning Michael is going to break science. And unless I bring this point up right now, uh, the world, you know, is going to be more and whatever worse. Uh, so is there anything super pressing? People want to like raise their hands or anything unless someone somehow makes me aware that this is happening. Uh, no, it's stuck. Uh, I'm going to say so. Sebastian and Micah, again, in the interest of time. So I set up a separate Zoom that we can go chat on. Uh, if you guys want to leave this. Uh, so Michael, I guess the, um, the status quo, Corona rules, let's make them up as we go. You want to stay on this channel. Uh, you can answer any questions that come up, uh, which apparently are not earth shattering. Uh, and we'll log back on uh, after we have time to chat. And, uh, Perfect. Yeah, I'll stay here. All right, cool. Uh, Micah and Bash, I'm assuming you have that, that uh, invite. Thanks, Luke. That's nice. Uh, mm. The silence is killing me. Matt, where should I expect that invite?
being recorded. All right, Michael Bashi, are you back on the line? Um, well, I am. Uh, I am. All right, Michael. So yeah, me, Michael Bashi, uh, just chatted. Uh, so we wanted to congratulate you and let you know um, that you've uh, passed the speaking portion of your master's. Um, so yeah, congrats on that. I know it's been a lot of hard work. Uh, I've certainly, you know, uh, what's up? Congratulations. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, we talked, uh, about a couple of different things and, you know, things that can be buttoned up a little bit. So I'll give you that feedback offline yeah. Uh, and yeah, we can get the, uh, documents and everything, uh, pushed through. So yeah, just in the interest of time, we can keep it short. Congratulations again, Micah, Bash, I don't know if you have anything you want to add. Uh, just a quick question. When's the deadline to fill out the forms? I don't know if there specifically is one because uh, right now with, uh, yeah, I don't know if there is one. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, I think it's just as soon as you can. All right, so you can you follow up with that and just send us a, I will. Like, yeah. to whatever the form is. Yep. Um, all right, cool. So anyone who's still on the line, eight participants, not many, uh, you know, thank you for attending. Michael, uh, I will follow back up with you. Uh, and yeah, congratulations. Uh, right. Good work. Thank you, guys. Anyways, yeah. Thanks. Okay, Michael, uh, thanks again. I'm going to head out. All right, thank you.